Hello and welcome everyone. We're going to get started now. Um, welcome to the Emergency Workplace Organizing Committee's uh, book discussion with three authors and an editor of Labor, Power and Strategy, a uh, book published in January by PM Press. And you can feel free to uh, introduce yourselves in the chat if you like over for just the next few minutes. Um, and then we're probably going to turn it down for turn it off for a while. So EWOC uh, is a joint project of the United Electrical Workers, or UE, and the Democratic Socialists of America, DSA. My name is Sally Hayati. I'm a member of the EWOC Labor Education um, Team and DSA's National Political Education Committee. Um, after a one hour panel discussion, you are welcome to stay on, if you like, for a 30 minute audience Q&A session. Um, questions can be submitted using the Zoom chat feature after the end of the panel discussion um, at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And uh, closed captioning is available uh, for this meeting. Now I'm going to hand it over to the organizer of this event, uh, Eric Dernbach. Eric? Thanks, Sally. Yeah, I'll just speak for a minute just to frame like wh why we're doing this discussion. I've been you know, work for a few different unions in the labor movement for over 20 years and something that, you know, in various organizing departments, think about organizing all the time. We all know the crisis of the labor movement, which is that we've been declining, you know, really for 60 years. We're only about 10% of the workforce in the U.S., 6% in the private sector. Um, and there's been a lot of discussion over the past few decades about what strategies unions should adopt to turn things around knowing, of course, that it's not, not going to be easy under, under any circumstances. Um, and so the book, Labor, Power, and Strategy, um, I thought was really interesting uh, because you know, not only does it feature, I think, some really interesting ideas from Professor Womack, um, but it solicited responses from 10 activists and scholars who I thought brought a lot of other good ideas. And I think it's just overall a really good conversation um, about lots of different kinds of things that unions should be doing um, and, and responding in principally to, to the ideas of Professor Womack around organizing strategic positions. So it's a book that I recommend to folks, even, even folks that are relatively new to unions to get a good sense of lots of different issues and how folks are really grappling with this um, really tough crisis that we're in. Uh, I feel like the labor movement is, is, is in a crisis state because we are just growing, growing way too small. So with that, let me turn it over to Peter, one of the book editors. Um, and I'm gonna ask everybody just to introduce themselves. Um, and then we're gonna have um, uh, John, uh, Jean and, Hal and, um, and Melissa as well. Uh, and then we'll have questions. So I'll turn it over to Peter. Great. Thanks very much, Eric. Uh, I'm Peter Rolney. I'm in San Francisco, California, DSA member and retired organizing director of the International Longshore and Warehouse Union. And Eric wrote a great review of our book. And if you don't have time to read the book, the best review to read is his, because it gives you the whole book's contents and, and his own perspective. So I would recommend that was published by Jacobin. And thank you to Sally and Daphna for organizing this forum and discussion. I've been inspired by EWOC ever since its founding as a joint project of UE and DSA in 2020. And I was reminded of my passion for e Ewok when I saw an op-ed in today's New York Times entitled, The Belafonte Speech That Changed My Life by Charles Blow, a uh, frequent uh, op-ed columnist. And Blow describes hearing the great Harry Belafonte speak in 2013, and Belafonte's talk was a challenge to the status quo in black politics. And at one point he said, quote, where are the radical thinkers? And I have always viewed Ewok as a challenge to the status quo in the labor movement. Ewok is a positive and needed challenge to existing unions that are inadequately stepping up to the challenge of this movement moment. So uh, I hope that today's discussion meets Belafonte's challenge to think outside the box. So I'll give you briefly uh, the story of the origins of this book, Labor, Power, and Strategy from PM Press. Uh, as I said, I was the organizing director of the ILWU. The, the uh, photograph that uh, 
Sally put up is the ports of Los Angeles and Long Beach, where I did a lot of work. And in that capacity, I was able to witness the exercise of sectoral and positional power by workers in our union, capable of shutting down the whole economy in a week if the ports don't work, and then watching particular workers like crane operators and those giant cranes you see in the photograph, if they don't work, nothing moves. So I was inspired by that and I saw us exercise that power on many occasions, both on international topics, but also for the purpose of organizing new workers. And in 2002, I wrote an article in New Labor Forum emphasizing the importance of labor of the labor movement continuing to focus on logistics and manufacturing. And a few, few years later, I received an email from John Womack, Harvard professor, who I knew as probably the English speaking world's leading expert on the Mexican revolution. And he wrote a book in 1969 called Zapata and the Mexican revolution, which I had read. And he sent me a paper that he had written on this topic of strategic workers and strategic power that he had presented at an academic conference in Helsinki, Finland in 2006. And ironically, that paper has not been published as a book here in the United States, but has been published in Mexico. The title of Posición Estrategia y Fuerza Obrera was published in Mexico in 2007. And because of John's history and work as a historian of the revolution, the Mexican government decided in 2008 to give him the Medalla 1808, which was a celebration of the 200 years from the independence of Mexico and 100 years from the Mexican revolution. And John promptly uh, told the government, I'm not taking that reward, I'm giving the money to the ESME, Sindicato Mexicano de Electricistas, who had been locked out by the Mexican government. So John won my heart. He's a man who not only talks the talk, but he walks the walk. So I decided John's thoughts on strategic position ought to be recorded and, and published. And we did interviews with John in 2018. And then my co-editor, Glenn Parashek, suggested we ought to get 10 of the best organizers and scholars to respond to John Womack. And two of them are with us this evening, Melissa Shetler and Jean Bruskin. Now, some people have said I should have drafted 12 people to do this, and then it would have been biblical. We would have had 12 apostles. But uh, in fact, these folks who responded are not out there spreading the Womackian creed. Most of them say, yes, John, but, and you'll hear some of that this evening. So this is a really is a pocketbook of 152 pages with photos by Robert Gumpert. It does fit in your back pocket. It's useful for workplace strategy discussions. So I recommend it highly, get it from PM Press. So without further ado, I think we should jump in with uh, John Womack and uh, let him talk a little bit both about how his work in Mexico led him to this topic and give us a brief summary of his thesis and the way he looks at this question of strategic workers and strategic power. John. Uh, and thank um, all of you uh, who put this uh, show together. Um, I, I think uh, well, the the book uh, took uh, this question emerged in my mind uh, because after I wrote that book, my thesis and it got published on Zapata, uh, I decided uh, to write uh, a book about uh, Mexican industrial labor uh, uh, through the same well from the 18 from railroads in Mexico in the 1870s uh, to uh, probably up to 1940 and but in the course of doing some early research uh, in Mexico um, I was I noticed uh, in 1916 uh, during the revolution 
uh, in the thick of some of the worst fighting uh, uh, in, in those 10 years, uh, there, was, there were uh, general strikes in Mexico City, which by then was uh, it lost some population because of the wars going on there. Um, but maybe 300, 400,000 people and the general strike shut the city down. And I want, I, so I got interested and, um, uh, in those uh, movements. And I, then it turned out it was electrical workers. And um, well, I thought, so they turn out the lights, what uh, does that do? Uh, uh, but uh, Mexico City really by then and a lot of the factories around the city uh, and outside it uh, depended uh, on uh, electrical power. But most important uh, was that there was no union station in Mexico City. There were several uh, different uh, train companies, railroad companies that uh, brought trains into the city. And, um, but to move freight from one uh, station to another uh, for the national markets, uh, you had to uh, take a trolley and the trolleys ran on electric power. So uh, when you shut off the electric power, you shut down movements of heavy freight uh, through the city. Uh, and it turned out that uh, the, what really mattered was the people, maybe no more than a hundred or so at work in a power plant, the main power plant that fed Mexico City, um, um, about, I don't know, 60 miles north of the city. So when those people stopped work, uh, it shut down a city of 400,000. Um, and I thought, well, that's really interesting. I wonder, since electricity works the same way everywhere else as it works in Mexico City, I wonder how this works elsewhere. And so I started uh, a long kind of search uh, through the literature over the last uh, really uh, since industrialization, um, since the uh, first textile mills um, in, uh, in England. And uh, it turned out uh, that there were uh, a lot of movements of that kind. Uh, there wasn't uh, as much uh, theoretical attention to it, but there were reports of this kind of action. So I started looking into it and um, trying to find out. Uh, and eventually uh, I started looking into various industries. And, um, and because I work on Mexico, I, I looked at, I don't know, oil, uh, railroads, um, the different uh, brewing, uh, brewery, uh, textile mills and so on to try to find in them, uh, what were the strategic positions and um, so I put all that together. And, um, uh, but the, the main paper that Peter's talking about became uh, the, uh, the basis of a book I published, the book that he says uh, was published in, in Mexico um, in 2007. Uh, they, uh, and it, he and Glenn uh, have, have done wonderful uh, work about uh, getting the interviews with me done and getting all the uh, commentary. Um, and I would say that the main thing about the book is that the only way you get business uh, to uh, deal with you uh, is make it deal with you. You can't expect it to happen uh, by the goodness of their heart. And it's unlikely that uh, considering uh, how politics works still, uh, that the politicians are gonna do very much. Um, the, what, the main thing you can do is actually force business to, come to deal with you. Um, and you can do that. The only way workers have to do that is to stop working. Um, they, that, they, uh, it's the only thing, it's the only power workers have uh, to quit working. Um, and, uh, but where? Uh, just uh, to stop in work, uh, you may stop and every, the rest of everything goes on. 
But what happens is, I think, in any kind of uh, productive uh, system, small or large, there are uh, certain kinds of jobs on which other jobs depend. That if you don't, uh, like the crane operators, uh, if they don't uh, do what they're supposed to do, nothing else happens. Uh, but it's not only that highly skilled work. There are other much less skilled jobs uh, where uh, you, if people don't do them, um, in, a, in a hospital, for instance, um, if the, 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 the cleanup crew doesn't do its job, you can't run the hospital. Um, and and uh, 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 in a public school system, uh, the bus drivers make a huge difference. Um, and uh, so, and that's uh, railroad workers, of course, as well. Uh, and that's uh, one of the reasons why the laws about them striking are the way they are, that, uh, that they have a very difficult time and uh, practically illegal uh, for them to strike because uh, the, it would shut down uh, the economy. So um, in, uh, in small places um, and in the whole economy, there are certain jobs on which other jobs depend. Um, and uh, it's not set in, uh, in forever. Um, it changes uh, because as workers discover that those places, and they are the ones who uh, are uh, most likely to know where those places are um, once they begin to think about it, um, that uh, the, the, and they, if they use those places uh, to force uh, 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 some stoppages, um, the sooner or later, uh, the company will try to find a way to uh, relieve that uh, bottleneck uh, and uh, make it go away. So uh, these places keep changing, but uh, there are always some places. Um, the, uh, some of the uh, commentary uh, uh, was uh, said, well, yes, that's right, but what about uh, what you call associational power? And um, I, uh, I didn't uh, really dismiss it, uh, but I did say that it was derivative. I didn't mean by that that it didn't matter. Uh, but uh, I think the difference is that uh, that kind of power, anybody can uh, raise and workers need that. Gene's uh, description in the book um, about uh, this, the, the movement at Smithfield uh, showed not only uh, a strategic position in the livestock department, uh, but also uh, uh, the real importance of a national network of support that could uh, call uh, the Labor Department, call the NLRB and make uh, pressure uh, on Smithfield. So um, I, I, uh, I certainly grant that, and, uh, but I, I, it's, uh, it's a power, that power, associational power is something that um, anybody can uh, organize. Um, and then uh, labor as uh, not only labor, but the companies. Uh, when uh, uh, the bus drivers in Boston go on strike, uh, that uh, the uh, school system is uh, ready uh, right away. It's illegal for them to strike, but they do sometimes. Uh, but uh, not the bus drivers, but the teachers. Uh, but uh, uh, when uh, uh, they do go on strike. The, the school system is quick to uh, raise uh, uh, holy hell among the parents uh, and who are, uh, and that creates pressure uh, on the drivers. Um, and so, but the one thing that workers can do uh, because uh, all they have is their working power um, is to stop work. So that it is a strictly speaking, uh, uh, the, uh, the strike 
or the disruptive action, whether it amounts to something legally a strike, uh, but the disruption that you can cause is something that only workers can do because they can they cause it by stopping uh, and getting other people to stop. So um, that's the uh, the main point of the book, uh, and uh, the. I would say too that uh, the commentaries are are, are very uh, instructed uh, and uh, interesting uh, other uh, insights into uh, what makes uh, uh, confrontations uh, and conflict uh, at work. Uh, and I would say also that it's not oh I, it's not really a matter of a workplace. Uh, you can be uh, uh, spread out, um, uh, but uh, the way uh, even on a railroad, uh, the train crews are very different from um, uh, the uh, the railroad shops. Um, and so, on the shops, it's one thing, but on the trains, uh, it's another thing. But anywhere you can you can stop other people from doing their assigned uh, duties. Uh, then uh, you have a strategic point and you can raise strategic power there to disrupt and maybe uh, enforce uh, action on the part of your employer. So let well, that's me- great. That's great, John. And maybe, maybe we could start with one of the respondents, a very able organizer and educator, Melissa Shetler. I'll let her say some more about her own work, but she had a lot to say about your your thesis, so I'll let her jump in. Thank you. Um, thank you so much for, for hosting this, uh, Eric and, and the folks um, here, and John for spending so much time thinking about this and engaging in these conversations with Peter and Glenn and, and all of the respondents. Um, and I, you know, I was a yes and, as most of us were, um, you know, that I come from a space of real dialogic learning and the idea of that, you know, we we put our, our ideas out there for them to be workshopped, to be critiqued, to be discussed. And, and I think that the spirit of how you do your work is, is very much there. Um, and so that was a real opening for me. And, you know, I came to the labor movement sort of late in life um, and started out more in participatory education and sort of roots of Paolo Freire's work, but in like the embodied experience of art. Um, so I was happy to hear a, a shout out for Harry Belafonte, who, you know, brought us brought us the movement through his music and, and brought the music to the movement. And I, I also uh, became an organizer in the, the construction world. And so while I landed there, I, I learned a number of things about, at first, definitely uh, strategic uh, choke points. So the first thing that spoke to me was, yeah, um, this, this is totally how it works. And, you know, everyone in my local, I worked with a, a labor or a laborers local for, for many years. And then I worked with the Lathers, who are iron workers, and they do the reinforced concrete um, for sort of superstructures of concrete high rise. Um, and the crane is important, but also if you can stop the concrete, you stop the pour, um, no one can do the next form and no one can sort of do the layers of the building. As the building goes up, you build a form, you pour concrete, you build columns, you pour concrete, the next floor goes up. So that truck is super valuable too. And uh, and also, you know, it's only lasts so long. It's why it spins around, right? And sort of does its motion. And so it's another amazing choke point and also in the world of construction, and, and I know Eric from this, uh, it's a real open shop environment. So you need solidarity too, right? And, and we, found, um, we found that that's where that associational power was really important. But in all of this work, I started sort of running campaigns and, and found that we did a lot of work to educate our organizers by sort of doing organizer trainings and talked about you know one-on-ones and sort of how you listen um, and, and in my experience, we talked at people a lot and, um, and sort of assumed that we had a, like that folks would assume they had some knowledge and they were leaders and, and sort of would impart that knowledge upon people. And 
spend a lot of time um, just talking to people at people about that work. And so my reflection was that I think in order to, to get to this point of, of strategic choke points and to find good strategy, we needed to shift and we need to shift the ways in which we educate folks and the ways in which we approach education as a labor movement within our unions um, and our organizing departments um, and within our institutions of labor. Um, I, I've worked in a few that I, I honor their spaces, but you know it's a lot more HR these days than it is strategic organizing, right? And the few spaces doing that I, I'm excited by. But folks have a story to tell and they have the knowledge and you know, Womack does know this and talk about this, right? It's like, it's it's the exact knowledge of the body and the work and the repet repetition and the space in which you can stop production. And that's where people know how this works. And the next thing was for me was, well, how do we then shift to deciding which target it is and how do you do it and where can you exert that power and sort of what's the best one to choose? And, and engaging with folks in a process of getting to critical thinking and, and expecting them to do that. And I found in our education that it was a lot of turnout. It was a lot of like, give people talking points and send them out into the world and, and not sort of taking the time to be uncomfortable, to, to be aligned with the workers, to remember that we're in a struggle together um, the, of the working class. And that we're not experts and, and that we're co-learners. Um, and so I felt like this was an opportunity to think about how we talk about that because this idea that Paolo Freire put out there um, about that we engage in banking education, that we sort of take a thing and we insert it in you and then we say, give it back to me exactly how it is and, and you know that's how you get your check mark and, and I don't want you to you know disrupt it too much is not how people learn. And it's not how we get to a point of sort of liberation and a point of being able to disrupt the status quo, which is what we have to do. Um, and in fact, people need to feel like they themselves are the agents of their own experiences um, and, and understand their own power and learn to make those analyses themselves and, and workshop that stuff. And you know, one thing I've been thinking about a lot lately as we've been sort of engaging in these conversations around the book, which have been so exciting and Eric's review is wonderful and, and other people talking about this is, um, I think about the ways that we do organize our trainings with tools and we sort of talk about maps and, and power analysis and teaching people to create calendars. And, you know, this isn't that much different than the work Paulo Freire did and sort of has evolved into uh, in rural communities around literacy. Like we create maps of environments. We use the tools to talk about calendars of agricultural cycles. And, and you know, it's the knowledge of the people that, um, that figure out how we do this work. So I, I always go back to that and get excited by one, yes, let's like do more international organizing and a labor college and really reinforce this, but let's not like reinforce the idea of experts and subjects and sort of that's like what capitalism has done. Um, and it's done it in art too, right? It's like participatory experiences of people making art together versus like, and there are some wonderful artists who, who are talented and work hard, um, but we've really created this idea of the 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 expert, and and the rest of us are just supposed to sort of be consumers. And so I would bring that into this space as well to just say, um, you know, let's do our education as if all of our our members are our experts. Thank you, Melissa, and, and Rand Wilson, who's also a very talented organizer. I think stressed similar point around learning from workers in terms of understanding these strategic um, positions that John has talked about in the interviews. I think it'd be good if we go now to our uh, third panelist, uh, dear friend and comrade of mine, Gene Bruskin, who I met in Boston when he was leading the Boston Bus Drivers Union during the busing crisis. I would commend to people, there's a new book by Dennis Lehane called Small Mercies, which is a crime novel that's set in the 
50 years ago during busing. Incredible book, and he's got a real ear for, for Boston and the accents. Uh, but Gene is a wonderful, talented organizer who probably needs very little introduction to everyone, but I'll let him talk about himself as much as he likes, and then maybe respond to John's interviews and talk a little bit about his own experience. Gene. Uh, thank you, Peter. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, John, for doing this, you know, uh, and it's good to be on with you and with Melissa and, and, uh, and Ewok that have really tried to generate a lot of activity these last few years when it was really needed. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I think, you know, the context of this book coming out, uh, it, you know, in terms of how we think about the labor movement, and where we are in the United States is really interesting because um, <clears throat> we have a shrinking labor movement, but on the other hand, we have the highest union favorability that we've had in a long time. We have a lot of new organizing at places like Starbucks and Amazon and Trader Joe's, but not necessarily with the established labor unions in a lot of cases. Uh, and in many cases, definitely not with the logistics sector, for example where we think of where the power would be. And uh, <clears throat> uh, on the one hand, what has sort of been the operating system in this country, you know, since at least the eighties of what we call neoliberalism, you know, market driven uh, uh, system is sort of collapsing. And so on the one hand, we have uh, the rise of the right. And on the other hand, we have all these people who want to call them, who are calling themselves socialists, I want to be in the labor movement, and uh, uh, so it it's uh, it it it's it's an important moment. And uh, some of the things that have been happening uh, sort of reflect what I think are some of the best parts of the labor movement trying to figure this stuff out. You know, where you've got the strike at Rutgers, where they're bringing multiple unions together and they're striking for the lower paid people. We just saw something like that in. Uh, where UTLA, uh, the entire UTLA, 35,000 people walked out to support SEIU, representing some of the lower paid workers in the system. And you have a teacher's union like CTU transforming the city enough that their one of their members becomes the mayor of the third biggest city. Um, and so uh, at the same time, <clears throat> A lot of the AFL-CIO itself, for example, is not in the middle of any of this, but you have this change within the UAW that's happening. And uh, you have a really a, a new dynamic inside the Teamsters. And as we speak, the UFCW, for the first time in memory, actually has a dissident move inside of their convention right now where there are uh, <clears throat> a whole emerging sort of TDU-like movement calling for one member, one vote, uh, and more power and involvement of the workers. So uh, this is an important moment. And John raises the issue of power. And power is not usually something that the labor movement talks about. You know, uh, we talk about power only to the point of trying to get a contract, you know, or trying to get the Democrats uh, elected. But yet, uh, um, really, we all know that, first of all, the Democrats' uh, power is sort of dependent on us. We just don't act that way. And the, and the economy of our country is dependent on us, but we don't act that way as a labor movement, and most workers don't see it that way. So this question of how do we flip that, um, and what John is sort of raising is uh, <clears throat> the ability and the power that we have to actually disrupt the operations of this country. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I think we saw just the glimmers of that when the railroad unions were threatening to go out, uh, that uh, there was almost a total panic. But one of the articles in the book, interesting enough, is from Carrie Dahl, who is the national <clears throat> organizing director for the uh, uh, Building and Maintenance Away employees. And his job primarily was to build the activity of the membership, which was a really dead membership when he came in, 
but found that if you give people the right training and the right kind of support that uh, people that even haven't been involved for many years will get involved. So to begin to even think of doing the kind of things that John lays out, we have to do the kind of things that, uh, that uh, we just heard of uh, in terms of from what Melissa's talking about. We got to educate our members in a real way. Uh, in terms of choke points, uh, I think that we could say that probably every workplace in the country, <clears throat> if you thought about it enough, there are some choke points. And by choke points means, I think of the, that group or those workers who without having even having to have every single person involved could possibly shut the place down. Uh, and the, the experience like that, that I uh, wrote about in the book uh, provoked by John's uh, question here was when I was working at the organizing the uh, packing house workers at Smithfield, North Carolina, <clears throat> they kill 32,000 hogs a day. It's the biggest meat packing plant in the world. And there's constant turnover. And this is a question people ask me all the time you know, from Amazon and everywhere else. How do you possibly organize when there's constant turnover? Well, uh, you don't. maybe you don't capture everybody all at once, but that doesn't mean you can't move things. At Smithfield, we found out <clears throat> that in the livestock department, which is where these 32,000 hogs enter, the plant every day, there's 90 workers and their job is to take these hogs, these mad hogs running off the truck from nine years in a cage and somehow put them through these ramps and, and get them lowered down to the kill floor. And uh, if they don't do that, then there's no work for the rest of the plant. And these guys came to us and said they weren't getting warm water and soap to wash their hands and clean drinking water. And uh, so <clears throat> we decided that was a choke point. And we got the, some of our leaders inside the plant uh, to begin working with people. And we went with some of those workers and visited all 90 workers at home. And they put in a petition to the boss and the boss said, not surprisingly, go to hell, but we'll meet with you one-on-one. -on -one. <clears throat> and so <clears throat> they, uh, uh, they picked the time and all 90 workers just sat down. And uh, as you can imagine, it's easy to get those 90, those uh, hogs off the truck when you just open the door. But once they're off that truck, it's really hard to get them back in that truck. They don't cooperate. And so it created a panic and hundreds of trucks are lined up uh, immediately when the workers sat down. That's all they did. They just sat down, took out a cigarette or whatever. Uh, then they called OSHA and they said, excuse me, OSHA. But in the biggest plant in the world here in North Carolina, uh, we're sitting down because of these atrocious conditions. You ought to come over. And then they picked up the phone and called the media and said, uh, hey, you know, they got a pretty good story here. Let me pass it to another worker. Uh, <clears throat> meanwhile, on the outside, we were bombarding them with what John calls an associative power, all the allies they had. We had hundreds and hundreds of people calling them, emailing them. Uh, just overflowing their uh, uh, communication system. And Reverend Barber showed up with some ministers and some people from the community to pray for warm water and soap uh, in front of the plant. And it shut down and within 48 hours, within 24 hours, the company had caved. Within 48 hours, they had built a new facility inside there, uh, like a lunchroom right there on the, uh, uh, in that area of the plant. Only 90 people out of 5,000 participated, but it terrified the company and it inspired people in the rest of the plant. Uh, and we tried to start doing that in some of the other key departments. Uh, it wasn't the only key department, but it was a really uh, important one. And so <clears throat> I think part of the whole question here is uh, what, what I think a lot of us call class consciousness. And, uh, I think of the class consciousness as this sense of like, who has the power? And I think the average worker, and unfortunately, a lot of times the union, we have the perspective that the boss has the power and we need the boss because we need a job. But the truth is the boss needs us. And that is the flip for class consciousness that we need to do in order to be able for workers to really begin to feel powerful 
And I'll just end on a quick story that I've told in some of these uh, uh, these conversations here <clears throat> of a banquet waiter. And the banquet waiter uh, was serving one of these huge banquets and, uh, you know, hotel worker, unionized guy. And he, his job was to put out the bread and the butter. And he put the bread and the butter out on some of the tables, starting with the big table toward the front. Uh, and he starts moving on and somebody runs up to him, a young guy in a suit, all spiffy and says, excuse me, uh, but this is the, this is Senator such and such's table. And the senator uh, is a very important man and he wants uh, a second piece of bread and butter. And the waiter says, well, I mean, uh, I'm sorry, but everybody gets one piece of butter and one roll. The guy says, well, you have no idea. You don't even know who this guy is. This guy is did this and he's done that. And the waiter just stood there quietly. And at the end of the conversation, the waiter said, uh-huh, I know that. Well, do you know who I am? The guy said, no, who the hell are you? And he says, I'm the guy in charge of the butter and the rolls. And he's only getting one. And he walked off. <clears throat> uh, so to the degree that we can sort of flip that perspective uh, on workers, uh, then I think that they begin to feel the power that they have and they can begin to confront the... Uh, the fear, and that's what collective activity uh, uh, can do for people.